righty, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this time we have to study your word on your appointed time, your Sabbath. We, we pray, Father, as, as always, uh, that your spirit lead us and guide us as we go through Leviticus and also the book of Esther. And we also pray for those that are, that are hurting among us in our assembly in particular. Uh, we do pray for Sherry, for her to be healed and, and others uh, with problems. We pray, Father, for, uh, for your providence and your healing. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. Okay. Um, yeah, if you would keep Sherry in your prayers. I'm, she's uh, having difficulties. She called me on the way here and was, she's, she's being tormented. <clears throat> um, we're on Leviticus chapter 9. And verse 1 says, Now it came about on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Now the eighth day is a reference to the eighth day that Aaron and his sons were consecrated as priests. Now, it's, it's not a reference to the eighth day of the month or anything like that. Seven days of cleansing is a typical time period and was commanded at the end of the previous chapter. That was in Leviticus 8, verses 33 through 36. We read, And you shall not go outside the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days until the day of, that the period of your ordination is fulfilled. For he will ordain you through seven days. Yahweh has commanded to do as has been done this day to make atonement on your behalf. At the doorway of the tent of meeting, moreover, you shall remain day and night for seven days, and keep charge of Yahweh that, uh, and keep the charge of Yahweh that you may not die. For so I have been commanded. Thus Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh had commanded through Moses. <clears throat> now in the previous chapter we saw that the consecration of the high priest was very similar to many events that occurred near the end of the life of, of Yeshua. He was being set apart for a very special work for his father. He was consecrated for the priesthood. Then the offering takes place, just as we see in this chapter in Leviticus. And Yeshua was apparently his own offering for his own ordination into the priesthood of Melchizedek. Let's look at verse 2 of Leviticus 9. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a calf, a bull for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before Yahweh. It's not until after the seven days of ordination that the altar may be used for sacrifice, uh, sacrificial offerings on behalf of Israel. <clears throat> Keep in mind, you got to get the, the priest has to do it, and he's just being ordained right now. So we have to wait for that to finish. Verses 3 and 4. Then to the sons of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, both one year old without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before Yahweh, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today Yahweh shall appear to you. Now the purpose of the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering, and the grain offering is that Elohim's going to appear to the, to the people. They are to prepare themselves physically and spiritually for this event. Yeah? Yeah. At the, previ at the end of the previous chapter, they said you're going to stay here at the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days and nights. Okay. So this, now, this chapter starts on the eighth day. It's a requirement, yes. Yes, they were required to do that. So no offerings until this time period's over. Okay, I heard this, but I was still reading the report. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Verse 5. So they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the whole congregation came near and stood before Yahweh. And Moses said, This is the thing which Yahweh had com has commanded you to do, that the glory of Yahweh may appear to you. Moses then said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people. Then make the offering for the people, that you may make atonement for them, just as Yahweh has commanded. This is the first time Moses has commanded this ritual, uh, handed this ritual over to, uh, to Aaron. And he was to make the offerings for the atonement of, of the sins for himself and also for the people. 
Verse 8, so Aaron came near to the altar, slaughtered the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And Aaron's sons presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, put some on the horns of the altar, and poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. The fat and the kidneys and the lobe of the liver of the sin offering, he then offered up in smoke on the altar, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin, however, he burned with fire outside the camp. So Aaron uh, first makes this offering, the sin offering, for himself. And all the commands are properly followed. It has to be done his way. <clears throat> Verse 12, then he slaughtered the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around on the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him in pieces with the head, and he offered them up in smoke on the altar. He also washed the entrails and the legs and offered them up in smoke with the burnt offering on the altar. And this is the burnt offering. It's administered according to the commands of Elohim and has to be done in uh, a particular way, and that's how they did it. Verse 15, then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering, which was uh, for the people, and slaughtered it and offered it for sin like the first. He also presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the ordinance. Next he presented the grain offering and filled his hand with some of it and offered it up in smoke on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning. So he presents the sin offering, the grain offering, and, and the morning's burnt offering, and this is on behalf of the people. Verse 18, he slaughtered the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around on the altar. As for the portions of fat from the ox and the, from the ram, the fat tail, and the fat covering, and the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver, they now placed the portions of fat on the breasts, and he offered them up in smoke on the altar. Everything is done according to the commands of Elohim. <clears throat> Verse 21, but the breast and the right thigh Aaron presented as a wave offering before Yahweh, just as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. So Aaron presents the breasts and the right thigh as a wave offering. And once again, that's, they, they take that and they wave it in the four cardinal directions, signifying that Elohim is the Elohim over all the earth. between the sin offering and the burnt offering? Yeah, the burnt offering is a fellowship offering. Okay, The sin offering is a non-sweet savor offering that is a command. You have to do it. Burnt offering is part of the fellowship. That's right. It's a, it is a, it's a, it's a voluntary. Completely voluntary. <clears throat> Verses 23 and 24. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. I don't blame them. Aaron presents that and Elohim then presents himself in a mighty way here to the people. There's some two million people there or more. <clears throat> and they're astonished at what they saw. They all shouted. They all fell down on their faces. It was probably similar to what happened when Elijah went against the priests of Baal. You remember that? That's in 1 Kings 18, verses 36 through 40. Then it came about at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Today, let it be know, known that you are Elohim in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Yahweh, are Elohim, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces. And they said, Yahweh, he is Elohim. Yahweh, he is Elohim. Then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Okay, now, what's the significance of this fire coming out from Elohim and consuming those offerings? That's it. He accepted it. This is good. You've done well. Now... <clears throat> We're, on, we're going to go over chapter 10 also. Chapter 10, uh, you know, Leviticus, 
has very little action in it. It's a book of instruction. But here we have a little bit of uh, action. It's not really a happy change of pace, though. This chapter involves the death of Aaron's two sons. And their death is caused by disobedience. Now, did you notice we, when we talked about the sin offering, the burnt offering, the grain offering, this was done according to the ordinance. Okay? This was done according to the ordinance. Um, Aaron's two sons didn't do, it, didn't do what they were supposed to do. <clears throat> um, their, their death is caused by disobedience, and it's not precisely spelled out what they did wrong. But the fact is, they didn't do exactly what Elohim told them to do. So, the question arises, how do we know what Elohim wants us to do? You know, we look into Scripture for his instructions. Don't take anybody else's word for it. Look at it. Read it. You know, we, we need to know these things ourselves. We've got to know it. it. Elohim will not tolerate casual disobedience to his Torah. He does not tolerate that. In um, Deuteronomy, and it did get up there, never mind. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, I was going to reference, but it's not in the PowerPoint. It got raptured, so we'll, we'll keep moving here. Um, have you heard, uh, back when you were uh, going to church, have you heard that you need to listen to the pastor? Okay, He needs to tell, and he needs to tell us what we need to know. All right, well, the pastor's not Moses. All right, he's just another guy. And what they do on Sunday mornings is they will, they will go over and give you what they've been taught in seminary, and that's it. No, they don't have seminary in a lot of these places now, huh? Right. Right. <clears throat> you know, an elder is to teach and guide, but how do you know that he's taking the right direction to teach and guide you? I mean, how do you know that? We have a lot of denominations teaching vastly different doctrines in Scripture. You know how many different denominations we have? There are more denominations than there are verses in the Bible. It's close to some 40,000, like Cliff just said. And there aren't that many verses in the Bible. See, we, we should look into Elohim's word on our own. Most everybody I know can read and comprehend. Okay, Re They really can. And that's what we need to do. <clears throat> well, sure, and that's why I put everything up here. And it's always the scriptures that are up here. That's what we need. Let scripture speak to us. And tell us how things are, instead of us telling Scripture how things are. You know, these two sons of Aaron, uh, Nadab and Abihu, they, they wish they had. Let's look at the first two verses here. Um, Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And the fire and fire came out from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. You know, um, don't misunderstand the consequences of disobedience to Elohim, and uh, it's very, very serious. You know, what did these two guys do wrong? We're not really even told. We're told it was a strange fire before Yahweh. You know, it's possible they didn't light the censer of incense with coals from the altar. That's explicitly required. Leviticus 16, verse 12, And he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before Yahweh, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. I don't know if they got out their cigarette lighter and did it themselves, did it different. Yeah, from their own fire, whatever. But that's probably the only correct method of lighting the incense right there. Their timing might have been off. They may have wanted to continue the display of the consecration of the priests that was done just previously. Okay, they may have wanted to continue that. It's also possible 
They went behind that veil at the Holy of Holies. Now that's, that's a no-no. Strictly forbidden. <clears throat> Leviticus 16, verses 1 and 2, Now Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had approached the presence of Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron, he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil, <coughs> excuse me, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So that's totally prohibited. Uh, some people think this judgment was too severe. It was too quick. Um, but Elohim's method hasn't changed. Do the names Ananias and Sapphira ring a bell to anybody? That's in the... No, no, this comes from the book of Acts. Okay. Watch, uh, look in Acts 5. You'll remember this as we start reading it. Same type thing happens. Okay. Acts 5, starting at verse 1, a certain man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back some of the price of the land? See, now, this was, this was not something they had to do. This was, uh, everyone was pitching in here because there was a lot of poor among them. And uh, people were selling what they had and, and, and sharing with everybody. And, you know, they could have said, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to do an 80-20 here. We're going to keep 20 and we're going to give you 80. But no. They make this claim, we sold the land, this is what we got for it here. This is what you get. We're giving it all to you. That didn't work out so well. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to Elohim. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. And the young men arose and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. His wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yeah, that was a price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you've agreed together to put the spirit of Yahweh to the test? Now, how do you put, what is it when you put uh, Elohim to the test? What is that? That is questioning his presence, okay? Why are you putting him to the test as to whether or not he's here? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out as well. And she fell immediately at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in, found her dead, and they carried her out, buried her beside her husband. See, uh, that's not much different than what happened to Nahab and, and Abihu. <clears throat> except there was a fire thing involved with them. Let's look at verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Elohim will be treated as set apart from everything and everybody else. He's to be honored before all the people. If we are to do something for him, we are to do it his way. I don't know how to get that message across to when I'm talking about people, people say, well, I can rationalize, you know, doing such and I can rationalize doing Christmas. Uh, I can rationalize working on the Sabbath. See, it, no, you really can't. You can't rationalize those things. You think you can, but you see, Aren't they just putting Elohim to the test? Isn't that what they're doing? Questioning his presence there? <clears throat> Verses 4 and 5. Moses called also to Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle, Uz 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 Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So they came forward and carried them in their still in the tu their tunics to the outside of the camp, as Moses had said. Well, the bodies were burned, but the tunics weren't consumed. 
So that fire was specifically to kill those two young men. There's no doubt about that. Their clothing was still sturdy enough to support the bodies. <clears throat> the uh, other two sons of Aaron, why didn't they have them carry him out? He has two more sons. Well, if they're going to replace those two sons, they can't touch a, a dead body for right now because they got, they got stuff they got to do. All right, so they get his cousins in there. And they say, get out here and, and carry them boys out, out of here. <clears throat> so those unclean dead bodies were removed by those cousins, and they were likely buried. We don't know how they dealt with those dead bodies. Burial is likely, and if so, it was certainly in an un unoccupied place. Verse 6, Then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you may not die, and that you may not become wrathful against all the congregation. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, should, shall bewail the burning which Yahweh has brought about. You shall not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting, lest you die. <clears throat> For Yahweh's anointing oil is upon you. So they did according to the word of Moses. Aaron and his two sons are not allowed to mourn the death of, those, of their, brother, their brothers and sons. They were representatives of the people before Elohim. And for them to mourn what happened is to say Elohim was wrong. Okay? That's not going to happen. You're not going to represent rebellion to Elohim. And I'm sure they were sad going about their duties. <clears throat> why did the boys disobey? You know, we don't know why or what they did exactly. A lot of people speculate, but it's all speculation. They didn't use the correct fire, whatever that means. In the next passage, though, it tells us likely why they disobeyed and used the wrong fire. Verses 8 and 9. Yahweh spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you may not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. Hmm. You know, it's very possible or likely that Nadab and Abihu were drinking too much, and then they went and tried to do service to Elohim and did it wrong? <clears throat> there is no teaching in Scripture against alcohol that requires abstinence from alcohol unless you take the Nazarite vow. The only place where it's very clear is in when you're in special service to him. You are to serve Elohim with a clear, a steady, and a sober mind. <clears throat> Verses 10 and 11. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, between the clean and the unclean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh has spoken to them through Moses. When teaching the word of the Father, it is to be done with a clear, totally clear mind. The teacher has to help others know how to distinguish between the set apart and that which is not set apart, between the clean and the unclean, <clears throat> James speaks about the responsibilities that are put upon a teacher. In James 3, verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. Well, you know, there's, there's with responsibility, uh, it, there could come very bad consequences. Verses 12 and 13, Then Moses spoke to Aaron and to his surviving sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Take the grain offering that is left over from Yahweh's offerings by fire and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it moreover in a holy place because it is your due and your son's due out of Yahweh's offerings by fire, for thus I have been commanded. We're told this in Leviticus 2 concerning the grain offering. The priests are to eat of it at a holy place or in the holy place. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15. The breast of the wave offering, however, and the thigh of the offering you may eat in a clean place. You and your sons and your daughters with you, for they have been given as your due, and your sons due out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the sons of Israel. The thigh offered up, or offered by lifting up, and the breast offered by waving, they shall bring along with the offerings by fire of the portions of fat to present as a wave offering before Yahweh, 
So it shall be a thing perpetually do you and your sons with you, just as Yahweh has commanded. Moses repeats these commands concerning both the grain offering and the peace offering. The priests are to partake of these offerings, and it's part of the consecration of the offering. <clears throat> when they eat of it, that's part of it being set apart. Verse 16, so, but Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it had been burned up. So he was angry with Aaron's surviving sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, saying, Why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? For it's most holy. And he gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yahweh. Behold, since his blood had not been brought inside into the sanctuary, you should sure, uh, certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary, just as I commanded. Oh boy. Now, Aaron is thinking... I'm like, I'm running out of sons here, okay? He knows they messed up. They committed a sin. However, however, it wasn't deliberate. The sin offering was to be eaten in the holy place. This was not done. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that these two guys, uh, Eleazar and Ithamar, did not pay as close attention as Nadab and Abihu initially. Because, you know, we only come in to pinch hit. Not as big a deal, right? You never know when that pinch hitting is going to, you're going to be called for. Well, they're called away right off the bat. Well, you're replacing the two starters. And I don't think they paid as close of attention as they should. <clears throat> Verses 19 and 20. But Aaron spoke to Moses, Behold, this very day they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yahweh. When things like these happen to me, if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of Yahweh? And, and when Moses heard that, it seemed good in his sight. Aaron is saying that they did not do this because they're in mourning. And it's mentioned in Torah to not eat while in mourning. <coughs> That's in Deuteronomy 26, verses 13 and 14. And you shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I've removed the sacred portion from my house and also given it to the Levite and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments which you've handed me. I've not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. <coughs> I've not eaten any of it while mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. I've done all according to all that you've commanded me. So, Aaron brought up a, a point here, and he says, and this was unintentional. Aaron took responsibility for the mistakes of his last two sons. <coughs> you know, if nothing else, I would think those two boys kind of lost their appetite. They just had their, uh, their brothers carried off, and they were dead. They didn't eat the sin offering in the holy place. They probably didn't feel worthy to do such would be my guess. And you know, the lesson for us to remember from this account, we can't come to Elohim on our terms. Okay? We can't take the word of Elohim and twist and contort it to meet our needs or someone else's instructions. We can't do that. We do not make the rules. We do not make the rules. Elohim does. We've got to be mindful of, of this in everything that we do. And uh, I, I just recently wrote a, a rebuttal against uh, this, this guy who uh, thinks that we should be disobedient to the Father's Word. And he's a typical Christian Baptist guy. But he wrote a, a nine-page article that says we should not follow the Torah. We, and if we do so, we're sending ourselves to hell if we're obedient to the Father's Word. That convoluted type of, of thinking. And he goes through and to say, well... God has his laws, but you know, Jesus gave different laws, and then Paul gave laws too, and the apostles gave laws too. Really? Really, that's interesting. So who's more important? I see right away, who do they kick out first? Elohim's laws. Kick them out first. And as his example, 
of Jesus using new laws. He said, no, uh, Jesus uh, said to uh, love your neighbor. See, that was new law. Uh, what did Leviticus 19.18 say, you sad whatever? Let's, love your neighbor as yourself. I, I just... <clears throat> Elohim's instructions are forever. Okay? We are to do things his way. Well, you have God's laws, and you got Jesus' laws. Then you got Paul's laws. Then you got the apostles' laws. Just make your own. Yeah, well, that's, that's in succession. That's the way it should be, shouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let's take a break for about five minutes, and we'll come back and we'll go through a few chapters of Esther. <laughs>